Hazaku Baruch Rabbi. Thank you so much for uh, the beautiful introduction. And it's uh, great to be here. <clears throat> As the year comes to an end, and the Torah that we're reading comes to an end. And the Torah tells us, at the end of his life, God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, Hen karevu yamecha lamut. God says to Moshe at the end of his life, Now your end is very near. It is time for your days to come to an end. And Moshe Rabbeinu says back to Hashem, very puzzled. How can you use that word, Hen, against me? When I am the one that said, Hen, la Hashem elokecha, hashamayim ushmei hashamayim. Moshe was the one who proclaimed about Hashem, that He is the God of the heavens, God of the universe. And he uses that word, hen, to pronounce that. And so the Midrash gives a mashal. To imagine there was a, a, a person who gives the king a beautiful gift. He wants to thank the king for being so kind and gracious. So he presents the king with a beautiful, sharp sword. Very expensive. And the king takes the sword and he commands his right hand guard to kill with this sword the very man that just gave him that gift. And the man says to the king, you want to kill me with the sword that I presented to you with it as a gift? Moshe says, Hashem, you want to kill me? But with the word hen? I use the word hen for you. I use the word hen to tell everybody how great you are. And God says back, yeah, but you know what, Moshe? And he calls him, according to the Midrash, he calls Moshe a shachen ra. He says, you are a bad neighbor, Moshe. Because yes, you used that word hen one time about me, but you also used the word hen in a very negative way. And you said, Hen lo ya'aminu bi. Hen lo ya'aminu bi. You said that the Jewish people are not going to believe me about you, God, speaking to me. And you discredited Am Yisrael. This Midrash Rabotai needs a lot of explanation. Is this some kind of word game that we're involved in? That... God uses the word hen, and then Moshe is like, God, wait one second. Uh, I use that word hen for you, and then God's like, yeah, but you use also. Definitely nothing like that. But what our rabbis are telling us, and this is the interpretation of the Torah Temimah, and he says that that word hen, hen means indeed. Hen means badai, with certainty. And God says to Moshe, Hen karevu yamechalamut. You are certainly going to die. And Moshe says, God, you know, I don't have a problem with me dying. Eventually, I'm going to die. But that you use that word, Hen, as if it's with certainty. And I have no appeal. And it's a final verdict. How can you not give me one more chance to pray for my life? When I used that very word, hand of certainty, and said that you are certainly the creator of the heavens and the world and everything around us. And the lesson that God tells Moshe next is very powerful, especially for in the time of year that we are in right now. God says to Moshe, yes, it's true, you use that word, hand, that I'm certainly the God, the creator, but you also used it about people. And never are we able to assume that we know what path a person is going to take in life. We can never write anybody off. Never to use the word hen about a person. Doesn't matter how many years in a row they have been living a certain lifestyle, how many times they have done a certain act, 
People can change. People can grow. People have free will. And our rabbis tell us in Pirkei Avot, a very powerful line, the following. In chapter 3 they say, Hakol Tzafui Vehareshut Netuna. And that means that everything is seen by God. Hakol Tzafui, God sees all, He knows all. Hashem knows everything. Hashem knows what's going to happen in five years from now. He knows which person is going to do which sin, which person is going to do which mitzvah. But the very next words in the Mishnah, Vehareshut Netuna. And that means, but even with that, even though Hashem knows the future, so to speak, we are still able, we still have the Reshut, we still have the free choice to change. And many times in life, we go around paralyzed because we allow people to label us. We allow the Yetzir Hara to label us. We allow our conscience to say about ourselves, me, I can't change. I can't be a good father, a good mother, a good husband, a good wife. I'm lazy, I'm arrogant. This is who I am. This is me. Okay? I'm an angry person. I don't have tolerance. And this is how it's been for 50 years, and it ain't gonna change. Hen, indeed, is never used on people. Everybody can change. Everybody can decide in a second that, you know what? This year is gonna be different. This year I want to become better. This year I want to grow. And Rabbi Salanter says so beautifully how it's so unfortunate that people are so certain of themselves and they question God when in reality it should be the exact opposite. They should be certain of God and they should question themselves. It is we who we should be uncertain about. It is us that we could say, no matter what happened before today, no matter what was going on in my life. And you know, our rabbis tell us in Masichet Derech Eretz, Masichet Derech Eretz tells us, you ready for this following line? Le'olam yihiyu kol b'nei adam hashuvin lefanecha kelistim. That we should always view everyone around us as if they're a robber. But at the very same time, we should give them the respect as if they are Rabban Gamliel. Because people are unpredictable. To suspect them, but to also respect them. Because we have no idea what people are capable of and what hidden talents lay within. And at any second, they could decide, if I was a robber, I'm going to be great. And that could work the other way around. If they are great, chas v'shalom, who knows what could happen. Suspect, but respect. Because everybody can be anything at any time. And so our rabbis tell us, that means that we should not despise anyone, right? Because sometimes in life there are people around us that we say, okay, this guy is a loser. That one, I don't, I'm never going to need a favor from them. And our rabbi say it's not true. Al tehibaz, never discredit somebody. Never put somebody down and say, well, it's okay for me to burn that bridge because I know I'll never need that person. And the rabbis explain why. She'en lecha adam, she'en lo sha'a. Because every person has their time, has their sha'a, their hour. They have their hour that they may be on top and we may need them. So we should never feel like this people out there that it's okay for me to get them on my bad side. That's the advice given by our rabbis in Pirkei Avon. But there's a deeper way of understanding that. And our rabbis are saying, in lecha adam she'en lo sha'a. What else does sha'a mean in Hebrew? 
Sha'a could mean time or hour, but Sha'a can also mean to turn towards. Like we find by Cain and Hevel. The Pasuk says that God accepted Hevel's korban, but ve'el Cain ve'el minhato lo Sha'a. Hashem did not turn towards the korban of Cain. God did not accept that korban. And what our rabbis are teaching us is this very lesson. In lecha adam she'en lo sha'a. There's no such thing as a person that cannot turn around on the drop of a dime. Everybody, no matter what their lifestyle was, no matter how they were living, no matter what their habits are, at any second that they are already in here, they are able to sha'a, they are able to turn, they are able to make a change for the better. And God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, very big mistake. If you think you can assume about the Jewish people and say with certainty, I know that they're wicked. I know that they're not going to believe in me. I know without a shadow of a doubt. Never say I know. We can never predict. Man is unpredictable. Man has free will. Doesn't matter what I've been doing till today. And I want to read to you an amazing story that's brought down in Professor Yaffa Elyaf's book, Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust. And I'm going to read to you from the actual book because it's such a powerful story. In the Janowska road camp, there was a brigadier from Lvov by the name of Schneeweiss. One of those people one stays away from if he values his life. He had known Rabbi Israel Spira, the Luzhava Rebbe, back from Lvov but was unaware that the latter was in an inmate in the Janowska road camp. Only a handful of Hasidim who were close to the rabbi knew the rabbi's identity and they kept it a secret. The reason of the Jewish holiday, the season of the Jewish holidays was approaching. As the date of Yom Kippur was nearing, the fears in the camp mounted. Everyone knew that the Germans especially liked to use Jewish holidays as days for inflicting terror and death. In Janowska, a handful of old timers remembered large selections on some Torah and Purim. It was Erev Yom Kippur, the eve of Yom Kippur. The tension and the fears were at their height. A few Hasidim among them, Mendel Freifold and others, came to the rabbi and asked them to approach Schneeweiss and request that on Yom Kippur, his group not be assigned to any one of the main 39 categories of work so that their transgression of the law by working on Yom Kippur would not be a major one. The rabbi was very moved by the request of his Hasidim, and despite his fears, for he would have to disclose his identity, went to Schneeweiss. He knew quite well that Schneeweiss did not have much respect for Jewish tradition. Even prior to the outbreak of World War II, he had publicly violated the Jewish holidays and transgressed against the Jewish law. Here in Janowska, he was a cruel man who knew no mercy. With a heavy heart, the rabbi went before Schneeweiss. You probably remember me. I am the rabbi of Prachnik, Rabbi Israel Spira. Schneeweiss did not respond. You are a Jew like myself, the rabbi continued. Tonight is Kal Nidre night. There is a small group of young Jews who do not want to transgress any one of the 39 categories of work. It means everything to them. It is the essence of their existence. Can you do something about it? Can you help? The rabbi noticed that a hidden shiver went through Schneeweiss as he listened to the rabbi's strange request. The rabbi took Schneeweiss's hand and said, I promise you that as long as you live, it will be a good life. I beg you to do it for us so that we may still find some dignity in our humiliating existence. The stern face of Schneeweiss changed. For the first time since his arrival at Janowska, there was a human spark in it. Tonight, I can't do anything, said Schneeweiss. I have no jurisdiction over the night brigade. But tomorrow on Yom Kippur, I will do for you whatever I can. The rabbi shook Schneeweiss's hand in gratitude and left. That night they were taken to work near the Lvov Cemetery. To this very day, the rabbi has scars on the beatings of that night. 
They returned to the barracks at one in the morning, exhausted, beaten, with blood flowing from fresh wounds. The rabbi was trying to make his way to bed one level of a five-tiered bunk bed made of a few wooden planks covered with straw. Vivid images from the past of Yom Kippur at home with his family and Chassidim passed before his tear-filled eyes that wretched that night at Junaska. Suddenly the door opened, and into the barracks came a young chassid named Ben Zion. Rabbi, we must recite Kol Nidre. Who can say Kol Nidre now? The people can't even stand on their feet. Rabbi, I used to pray for you in your shul. Do you remember the tone? And in the darkness of the barracks, among tents of hungry, beaten, exhausted Jews, a melody was heard. The soothing, comforting melody of Yom Kippur as Ben Zion chanted a prayer. No one knows how, but the news spread fast. In barracks number 12, they were chanting the Kalnidre. In the dark shadows of the Janowska barracks, one can see the dark shapes against the barrack walls as they made their way to barracks number 12. In the morning, the rabbi and a small group of young Hasidim were summoned to Schneeweiss's cottage. I heard that you prayed last night. I don't believe in prayers. On principle, I even oppose them. But I admire your courage. For you all know well that the penalty for prayer in Janowska is death. With that, he motioned to follow him. He took them to the SS quarters in the camp to a large wooden house. You fellows will shine the floor without any polish or wax. And you, Rabbi, will clean the windows with a dry rag so that you will not transgress any of the 39 major categories of work. He left the room abruptly without saying another word. The Rabbi was standing on a ladder with rags in his hand, cleaning the huge windows while chanting prayers in his compassion, and his companions were on the floor, polishing the wood and praying with him. At about 12 o'clock in the afternoon, the door opened wide, and into the room stormed two angels of death. SS men in their black uniforms, may their names be obliterated. They were followed by a food cart filled to capacity. Noon time, time to eat bread, soup, and meat, announced one of the two SS men. The room was filled with an aroma of freshly cooked food, such food as they had not seen since the German occupation. The tall SS man commanded in a highly pitched voice, you must eat immediately, otherwise you will be shot on the spot. None of them moved. The rabbi remained on the ladder, the Hasidim on the floor. The German repeated the orders. The rabbi and the Hasidim remained glued to their places. The SS men called in Schneeweiss. Schneeweiss, if the dirty dogs refuse to eat, I will kill you along with them. Schneeweiss pulled himself to attention, looked the German directly in the eyes, and said in a very quiet tone, we Jews do not eat today. Today is Yom Kippur, our most holy day, the day of atonement. You don't understand, you dirty dog. I command you in the name of the Fuhrer in the Third Reich, eat! Schneeweiss, composed, head high, repeated the same answer. We Jews obey the law of our tradition. Today is Yom Kippur, a day of fasting. The German took out his revolver from its holster and pointed it at Schneeweiss's temple. Schneeweiss remained calm. He stood still, at attention, head high. A shot pierced the room. Schneeweiss fell. On the freshly polished floor, a puddle of blood was growing bigger and bigger. The rabbi and the Hasidim stood as if frozen in their places. They could not believe what their eyes had just witnessed. Schneeweiss, the man who in the past had publicly transgressed against the Jewish tradition, had sanctified God's name publicly and died a martyr's death for the sake of the Jewish honor. Only then on that Yom Kippur day in Janowska, said the rabbi, that I realize and understand the meaning of the statement in the Talmud, that even the transgressors in Israel are as full as good, with good deeds as a pomegranate is filled with seeds. 
Never are we to write off anybody at any second. In lecha adam she'en lo sha'ah. At any second, a person could turn and could decide this year is going to be different. This year, I'm not the same person. This year, I can learn patience. This year, I could be a good spouse. I could be a good parent. This year, I'm not going to let the labels that other people or myself placed on me. And by doing so, by not using a hand on people, in return, God will be able to say about us, like we say in the prayers of Musaf, Hen ga'alti etchem aharit kereshit, that He will redeem us.